But thanks for being here tonight. Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep till he finds it? And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders. He goes home and calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Yes. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully till she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost, my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. Over one sinner who repents, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in the wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I'll sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one like of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead as alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what's going on? Your brother has come home. He replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry, refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But when he answered his father, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother, this brother of yours was dead and alive again and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Yeah. Have you ever lost anything really important? Really important? Have you ever lost anything really important? Do you remember the time that you lost something and it gave you that sick feeling? The other day, Janet and I were eating lunch with Beverly in Little Rock and uh, 
I gave them my credit card to pay for the meal. And when uh, it was time to leave, Janet looked at me and she said, uh, did they bring you your card back? I said, well, I, I guess they did. And I opened my wallet, looked in, and it wasn't there. I looked under the stuff on the table, and I looked around, and I got a real, real sick feeling. It had gotten that little leather thing they brought. They had crammed it way down in there. They gave them the receipt. The card was crammed, but I didn't dig in there and pull it out. But I thought, until I found that, I got this real sick feeling. Everybody ever had this kind of thing happen? Yes. You go like, man, I'm gonna have to go cancel this. You know about that? Oh yeah. yeah. I, I got to thinking about, um, we've got three different stories here, and I, I got to thinking that what really started me on this, I'm gonna take it out of order a little bit, but this, this woman, that it says she had 10 coins and she lost one. She lost something extremely valuable. Um, it, it had a monetary value, but the coin that she lost had a significant value concerning her future. Um, if you read commentary about this, you'll, you'll find that this coin had to be put back in its place or she could not be married. It, it's like uh, right before the wedding, ladies, right before the wedding, yeah. you lose your wedding ring. Mm -hmm. And so there's such an emphasis placed on this coin that she can't think of, a, I don't know how long you think about you ladies, I know it's a prolonged period of time, you, you plan for weddings and you think about the man of your dreams and all of that and think about you get, this is Karen's anniversary today. And Karen, just think about it. You couldn't have married him if you had a lost your coin. So your life has to stop. Everything that you plan for, it can't happen. And she's desperate. Everybody say we need to get desperate. And she's desperate. She's, she's broken hearted. Then we have a parable of the lost sheep. I've often thought of this parable and I, I really wondered what does this parable mean? I had, I had learned years ago about the parable of the coin and I remember a, 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 a teaching brother Denton in the old church down there. He did on the lost coin and very insightful, and he's the one that really enlightened me on that. But but I, 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 this other parable here of the lost sheep, um, it has to do with investment in wealth. See, in the day, right. it, it, back in the day, investment in wealth, man was gauged by the flocks and the herds, mm -hmm. or the vineyards, or whatever. But in this setting. Uh, this lost sheep that he goes and finds because of the value of it. That's right. you, ever, you ever lost your job? You, you ever lost your job? Have you ever gone through a financial downturn and you needed to work but no one would hire you? I mean, I, I went through, uh, oh, well, 16, about 17 years of education. I got out 1986, 87, went to security school, got out, could not find a job. I got to thinking about those financial times. Brother Henry was sharing me yesterday about uh, times when he was working and the kids were small. Do you remember those times? And boy, if you lost your job, it meant that they suffered. Anybody remember those days? Uh, you could took it by yourself, but I got to thinking, and there's, there's a couple of ladies in this church that have shared their economic 
downturn, if you were their financial calamity stories, uh, uh, a couple of them have told me about having to sleep in their car because they didn't have any, any place to go. And one woman, she, she's not here tonight, but she told me, she said, Brother Steve, I had to sleep with my kids in the car and I found a, a, a Baptist church that had uh, up the road here that had a, a, a night lights and I had my kids and I was scared so I pulled my car under that night light and I slept with my kids because I had no place to go and, and I was so afraid so this lost sheep is it's about that that loss of of, of what is of wealth if you will it's it's that, that, oh, can you imagine having to, uh, to, that, to that you lose uh, your sheep, which is so bad. You know, I've, got, I've got to get this sheep. I've got so much invested. So he goes and he, he leaves the 90 and 9 because, see, they're safe. And he, but he goes and he finds this one because it's, it's so valued. It has to do with, um, you know, what the, the financial aspect of our lives. The next parable Jesus gives us, the last one is, it's a lost son. It's not a coin. It's not a sheep. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can't get married. I've, I'm in a financial downturn. As bad as those two are, it's not like losing the sun. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Uh, how how do you? Jesus builds this in this setting, and he's he's giving us a bad to worse scenario. When it goes, you ever heard that saying? When it goes from bad to worse, Jesus sets us up and he gives us a bad to worse. How bad does your son or your daughter have to get before you don't want them back? How, how bad would your son or your daughter have to get before you, you say, don't come home? Now, I know y'all know about Wednesday nights, don't you? Okay. I have a friend of mine, I'm not going to give the details, but he was telling me, this happened some years ago, so don't try to figure out who it is. But his wife left him. He comes home from a trip. He comes home. The house is real quiet. She's not there, and, and she's, she's left. She found somebody else. He had three children. This is my memory of the story because best I can give you, he, he had a girl and two boys. Not, not too long in all of this is, and I don't remember the sequence of events, but he's got a girl and two boys and one of the boys has an aneurysm and dies. He's like 25 years old. And his other son turns into turns to homosexuality. He, he's talking to me about these life events that's going on and he's talking to me how much he misses his son that died and now he's telling me of how much he misses his son that has gone off into a homosexual lifestyle and he's, he's trying to figure out how to get him back. you don't know how far you're willing to go to get them back until it's your son. That's right. Amen. So, see, I'm trying to bring these parables to us. What, what, if, what if this were my son? What if this was your son? Yeah, come on. Uh, 
He just kind of, it just makes you say, you just think, oh Lord. Let's let's think of that son that has now he has he's asked for his father the inheritance and his father I read it to you that he separates and he gets to a place he's blown this inheritance and he's gotten so far and he's he's now a Jew feeding swine. You can only, if you know anything about you, it just doesn't get, it's a picture of, it doesn't get any worse. And he's got to be thinking, have I gone so far that I can't go home? By the way, the man that I'm telling you, he's still, he's still reaching out to his son. He's not approving of his life, but he's still reaching out. He's still looking and hoping yeah see the this, this prodigal son he's gotten to this place to where he's he's thought because of what I've done I I cannot even consider still being going back and, and acting like I'm his son. But if, if I go back, you think he, he, would he allow me to at least work for him? Yeah. The only way this boy gets to this place is he thinks he's starving to death. Yeah. Mm. That's yeah. worth taking a note. Um, how long does it take to reach the point to where you think you're starving to death? Anybody ever thought you were starving to death? No. Look, if I were starving, I could call anyone in this room. Yeah. This boy couldn't do that. That's right. yeah. Come on. And he's so yeah. low and he's so lost. He thinks, I'm starving. Yeah, yeah. If this boy hadn't reached this place of desperation, he would have never even thought about going home. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the same. Amen. Yeah. The place he turned it all around was when he thought he was starving to death. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. You ever tried to prop somebody up that you probably shouldn't have? <laughs> probably ever all of us in this room have done that. But this starving helped him make the change. Because if he hadn't been starving, he'd have just kept on. Yeah, that's right. Come on. You know, uh, I hear this, believe me, I hear it. We all make kinds, we make statements and judgments about other people. We probably would have been a whole lot better off if we'd have never said anything because it's not our son. It's easy, it's easy for me to look at you and talk, tell you what you ought to do about your son. Amen. But if it was my son, So where is it as a, a father or of a mother you say, I will take you back? <laughs> I, I had a phone call this week and the person asked me, the, I've never been asked this question before, but they asked me if I had any discernment. Because I allow people to come to church that still live sinful. Well, just so you know, I don't know everything everybody does. 
Some of us hide our sins really well. I didn't get one amen. But it's the truth. Anyhow. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that I can't do, but what I can do is I can come in here and I can worship. Yeah. And I can praise and I can pray. And I can believe God and I can teach the word. And then when anybody walks in here and they got something in their life, the Holy Spirit yeah. can convict them to a place and they'll come to that place and say, I got to change. Yeah, that's right. That's what I, I can't change you. Just because I don't shake my finger in your face and pull you off in a corner. And say, you better stop it. That, that, that doesn't mean I don't know what's going on. That's right. It doesn't mean I'm not concerned. You're not my servant. You know the Bible says that? You're the Lord's. You're the Lord's property. You're not my property. But my hope is when you come in here in the atmosphere of praise and worship and prayer and the word of God, then that curse that has you bound, that you surrender and it's broken off of your life. Did you notice how the chapter begins? Did you did you notice how this chapter begins? Look at the, the first, please. Put, put, put that first verse. Tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors were the most notorious criminals. That, that's why it's referring to this. Luke 15 and 1. The tax collectors and the sinners are gathering around to hear Jesus. The Pharisees are teachers of the law. And they say, this man welcomes sinners. Amen. What a thing to be said about you. Brother Steve welcomes sinners. Did you know how many sinful people go to church out there? Well, you're welcome. Amen. He's being criticized for receiving sinners. And and even he even goes so far that he eats with them. Be careful when you look at someone else and see their faults, but you can't see the hate in you. And through Jesus' eyes, that attitude is the same as murder. Mm -hmm. wow. Lust is the same as adultery. Mm -hmm. The contemplation of sin is if I get a chance, this is what I'm going to do. There you go. It's the same. Jesus said, okay, you want to start judgment? Here's how we'll do it. The hate, you're a murderer. The lust, you're an adulterer. Saint is committing the acts and when he's when he's teaching the lesson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, this church is not here so that simply three times a week that you have a place to go as a Christian. This church is here because someday your son, your daughter. Is going to walk through that door. Amen. And they're going to say, I decided to come home. Amen. See, the, the church is here right before my dad. Uh, he passed away, I tell this 
hundred times. I'm gonna tell it some more. He, he, I, I thought I, I knew he was, he was getting really low, and I had to be here. You know, Wednesday night I was, I was gonna miss, and I, I said maybe I just stay with you tonight, and he said, no. Keep the lights on. Keep the lights on. Amen. Why? Because your son yeah. or your daughter or your father or your mother or that man on your job, it could be on a Wednesday night. They pull up and they say, well, they canceled church. They canceled midweek services. And I was wanting to go home. Somebody needs to be looking forward to the day when your son comes home. Not your house, this house. That's right. So we keep watching. And we keep singing. We keep praying. We're not doing this for the motions of it. We're doing this because we're waiting Wait. on the sun to come home. Amen. Yes. Amen. They're going to come home. Yes. Thank you. If you have lost loved ones and you don't see the importance of why this church stays strong, you need to pray for yourself mm -hmm. because this may be one of those special places that at that special time they choose to go to, to go home. I've been, I've been thinking, I, I do this every now and then, I get in this, I get to thinking about all the people that I know that need to go home, need to come home. And when I think about that, I, I have to ask, is there anyone that I have excluded? Is there is anyone in your mind that, you know, you want to see your family, but is there anybody that, you know, I, I don't want to call names, but uh, could there be that person you say, I, I, I don't want them to come? In doing so, you may be excluding your own family because Jesus knows all, mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. I, I was thinking back um, I have quite a long story about making a statement to the Lord that I had done everything that he had asked me to do was one of the dumbest statements I'd ever made. And, but in my shallow thinking at the time, I, I just feeling overwhelmed and you can judge and ask whether it was the Lord or not, but I believe the Lord spoke to me and said, uh, you haven't gone into prison and within a day, uh, I got an invitation to go to Tucker Step Down Unit. Anybody remember when this happened? Before it? Somewhere, I, I'm trying to remember, I'm thinking it's around 2005. Uh, when we went in that prison, the first day I went there, I was scared. And then when we went back for the service, I was even more scared. Was anybody else scared Was with me? Brother Tim Wimmerly went. Yeah. Yeah. We took there. about 15 of us. When anybody was with me, raise your hand if you would. I was scared to go in there. <laughs> I was uncomfortable. They they take you through this gate, you walk through the courtyard, and they shut the gate, and then there's another gate, and then they open the gate, and then they remember that? Yes. And I'm standing in there going like I hear that click. And I can tell that click ain't like the fence that I use, you know. It's like, it don't come up. It clicks. You're in. Yeah. 
I'm scared, I'm uncomfortable because there I met a man who killed his wife. And there I met a man who molested children. And there I met a man on one occasion that I was raised with and I didn't recognize him when he walked up to me and asked me if I remembered him. I looked at his name tag and I looked at his gray hair and his withered face and he had to tell me who he was. Even after his time in prison, he, he's not allowed to get out. He was finally released into a community and as far as I know now, he's doing great. I'm not telling you this because it's easy to think about. I'm, I'm not telling you any other reason that that's somebody's son. You ever lost a son? Well, Brother Steve, I, I can't forget what happened. No. Forgiveness doesn't mean you forget it. Forgiveness is more, when you forgive somebody else, it's more for you than it is for them. So that you don't live in the bondage of unforgiveness. By the way, there's only one sin that the Bible considers unforgivable. Did you know that? Blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sin is a separator. Sin separates us from God. You can't live in sin and be close to God. Amen. Why, why would you teach a theology that allows the believer to think that they can sin and remain in right standing with God when sin, it's obvious, sin separates us from God. Yes. Well, how, how bad, how bad can you be and still Receive forgiveness. How bad? Will God forgive someone who kills Christians? Will God forgive someone who persecutes the church? Somehow we think that God died for us, but really he didn't die for everyone. Wow. Wow. Uh, because, you know, there's that person, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we could probably all imagine that person. And we might, we might say it, but we really don't believe God died for them. Lord help us. I got to thinking about this one man that I met. I'm pretty sure he killed his wife. And he had been there. He was an old man. He was probably 70, 75 years old when I met him. He's probably been passed. I'm pretty sure I, uh, he's passed away by now. God's grace is bigger than your grace. Amen. You and I, we would struggle to even try to comprehend God's grace. Yeah. Yes. 
the really the only way we comprehend it is when we look at ourselves and we know the secrets of our lives. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Because you just weren't good enough and you know it. That's right. Come on. Say amen if you know it. This is so easy to preach. It's so easy to hear <coughs> God's grace. But when you start living it, it'll try you. God's grace will try you to your bone. I said, Brother Steve, you, you think those people who ask for forgiveness of their sins, they should be allowed to go free? No. Nope. There's consequences for sin. That's right. That's right. Yeah. If that man was in prison for life, then I bet. I believe he should pay with his life for what he did. But he can still be forgiven. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's just, to see how easy that was for me to say? But it wasn't my mother he killed. That's right. See? Mm -hmm. It wasn't my daughter. <clears throat> I was privileged. Uh, I believe it was the last visit I went to Varner. And after the meeting that we were in, it was a church service setting, if you will. <coughs> And uh, Brother Eddie Joe, like he does, he had a special tour. Said, "I got us, I got us in the tour to go to Death Row." <laughs> and we're walking through the corridor of uh, to go to Death Row. We're just walking through. Uh, if you've never been, I know, like most of you, some of you've never been in prison like this. When you walk in there, it's concrete and it's metal. There's glasses with wires. There's there's mirrors. There's not mirrors. It's glass with wires in it. There's maybe fifty men in this, like a barracks. Their beds are just. I mean, you can barely walk through them. Over here, there's me. They're flipping me off, and I'm just walking down the corridor. Mm -hmm. And you look in there, and it's bad. But we're not to death row yet. We, we go in death row, you walk in, and these doors, they're shutting one door behind another. And there's there's windows in the, there's, there's clear glass in the floor, there's clear glass in the ceiling, there's big glass walls, and you look into death row, and there's cages, and they're small, and those men are in there 23 hours a day, and most of them are standing at the door screaming at the top of their lungs. Yet I speak of a grace. Mm -hmm. let, me, let, me, let me tell you this. The woman in our group went, they allowed her to go see, if my memory calls right, she got to go see the man, meet the man that killed her daughter. She was in this group. she was going to tell him that she forgave him for killing her daughter. You know what happens when someone See, I don't, I don't live. I don't live thinking about this. 
This is just something I started dwelling in. When, when, you, when you start thinking about the power that can forgive someone who has committed a heinous crime, you're talking about a power beyond what most of us have ever thought about. Okay? But God's grace and the power that he has is able to save a child Come on. or someone that you can't even comprehend how they've done what they've done. Yeah. Amen. Salvation is from one extreme to the other. You know the woman in the Bible that she brings the alabaster box and she pours it on the Lord? I don't know there's a there's a commentary on how many Marys and all that. I'm, I'm not getting into that. But, but, but I, want, I want to get you to this. Is, do you know what she had done? You realize what Mary was about? One of these Marys, the Bible says, the Lord cast seven devils out of her. Do you, you realize how bad this woman was? And, and what's, what's she doing? She's Watching the feet of Jesus, and they're saying, if you knew who she was, you wouldn't be letting her do that. <laughs> Why? Because they don't understand the grace. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm trying to help us. Yeah. That's good. So, <clears throat> trying. God's grace, it's amazing, and it? it searches for yeah. everyone he died for. Everyone he died for, his grace is searching for that person. Luke 8, 26. They settled in the region of Gathered Rings, which is across the Lake of Galilee. Jesus stepped ashore. He met by a man, demon possessed from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house. He lived in the tombs. He saw Jesus. He cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, don't torture me. Jesus, for Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man many times. It had seized him, though he was chained hand and foot, kept under guard. He had broken the chains and had that had driven him by the demon into solitary places. And Jesus says, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs. The herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs saw what had happened. They ran off, reported this into the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. That's a change of events. Those who had, who had seen it told the people about the demon possessed man and he'd been cured and all the people in the region asked Jesus to leave because they were overcome with fear so he got into a boat and the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him and Jesus sent him away and said go home return home and tell how much God has done for you so the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done can you imagine this it's a good Bible story but I'm not talking about a story I'm talking about an event that happened Amen. Do we get how bad this man is? Yeah. But the grace of God saves this man. The faith God mm. can. Yeah. 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 How far can you go, God? Mm -hmm. 
most of us struggle when someone smells bad and comes in and sits by us. Hmm? I'm not talking about demon possession. Somebody just didn't bathe. And we don't want to be, come on. Say amen if you don't. Man, he stinks. He may not have a devil, but he stinks. And we're struggling. This guy's been living in a graveyard. Right. You imagine the filth? Brother Steve, how do you know people have really changed? You have any discernment? Yep. And here's what Jesus said. I'm going to give it to you like I know how to give it to you. Jesus said, uh, here's how you know they really, they're really changed. Give it a little time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Give it a little time. What? Yeah. yeah, he said, you'll know them by their fruits. It might be a good thing if everybody in here would go plant a tree. I challenge everybody in here. I planted about a dozen trees this week. I planted them two days ago. I didn't drive over today to see if there's any fruit on them. Jesus said, if you want to know if they're really changed, it's going to take you a little time. I just always... I never really thought about that. But Jesus references a tree. Mm -hmm. It takes time for a tree to bear some fruit. It takes a little bit of time to learn. That's right. Come yeah. on, that's good. Yeah. You know everything that you know the first day? Did you get everything you know the first day you came to faith? Come on now. No. I'm here three times a week trying to help you grow. Now don't don't misunderstand me. I, I watch people come and they give their life and they leave a big puddle of tears and they get up and they don't have the burden they now down with. Yeah. But my own grandfather was at the altar praying after he had come to know the Lord and the woman was a pastor and she said. Brother Seibert, is that alcohol on your breath? He said, yes, ma'am. She says, you know, you got to quit that. And you know what he did? He quit it. When people come to me and ask me, Brother Steve, should I be doing this? I usually say this. This is my pat response so you don't have to come ask me. The Holy Ghost is already convicting you to come ask me to, if I'm not overriding him. So you just don't go ahead and give it up. Yeah, that's right. The Holy Ghost is already prompting you. You wouldn't be asking. That's right. Should, should I quit these? Well, the Holy Ghost is already telling you. That's right. You're asking. <laughs> huh? Say, thank you for convicting me, Lord. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, Brother Steve, I'm just not producing the fruit I need to produce. Well, dig around me. Water it. Pay some attention to it. Come on. Cultivate it. something 
probably most of us don't wash it like you used to. I watch my mama certain things she she would wash them by hand. You ever washed anything by hand? Yes. Huh? Come on, brother. Wash it. You squeeze it. You soak it. You pull it up. And you wash it. You see, you know what we're doing here every week? You know why you all come to church? Where I can help you wash oh, your robe. Right. Wash it by the water, oh, the word, uh -huh. spirit of God. Yeah. We'll get in here with it. Yeah. I can't help you much if you stay home unless you call me and invite me over. The gospel has come to imperfect people. <clears throat> For that person that has something in their life and the word and the spirit is helping you get that out because what sin does, it, it keeps you from closeness keeps you from being close. <clears throat> well, Brother Steve, I didn't have to get to the pig pen to wake up. Well, praise the Lord. Yes. But some people have to get to that place they think they're starving to wake up. What, what is it here? Jesus, he, he gives us a story, a parable of the coin, and he gives us a parable of the sheep. The story of the lost son. You know, you can sit in church and be lost. Did you know you can can sit in the church house and be lost. Yeah. Do you know you could be a disciple mm -hmm. That's right. and be lost? Mm -hmm. Did you know Jesus knew who Judas was mm -hmm. when he had picked him? Wow. Yes. Okay. And he picked him anyhow. Picked right. him anyhow. What is that? That's grace. Mm -hmm. It's it's Knowing the future. Judas was Jesus' destiny to get to the cross. Whatever your story is, whatever, wherever you're at, God's grace is right here with us tonight. I got here tonight by the grace of God. Amen. Lord will it? Yes. I'm going to come back Sunday morning by the grace of God. Josh is going to drive to Tennessee in grace. Amen. I'll close with this. Everybody remember this, 2 Corinthians 13. The Apostle Paul is preaching to the Corinthian church and he says, every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses and I've already already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it when, while absent on my return. I will not spare those who sinned early or any of the others since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him in our dealing with you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Yeah. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Come on. You know why you take a test? Take a test to see what you really know. Mm -hmm. Stand with me, please.
You ever failed a test and they said, oh, by the way, we're going we're gonna to retake it. You ever had this happen? You go like, oh, man. Grace. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. I pray that somehow, somehow, we will stretch ourselves to remember the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. And as we remember, may we not be forgetful of the grace that you extended to us. Strengthen us, Lord, by your power and your might, authority of your word. Produce fruit in our lives. Yes. Thank you. So that when people see us, they see you. Thank you for this evening. Keep us, bring us again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here.